Oh, hey there, homo sapiens. Today we're going to talk about one of the most controversial, yet also central concepts of anthropology, culture. What is culture? Well, a great deal of breath and friends have been lost over the topic in anthropology, and I feel that continuing to fight about it is kind of useless and distracts from what anthropology can really do for humanity. So I'm going to give you a deeply dissatisfying answer. You'll know it when you see it. Okay, okay, <laughs> I'll actually give you some definitions that different anthropologists have used throughout time, but First, I think we do need to have a conversation about what culture is not. Race. Many people have begun to use culture as sort of the politically correct term for race. A term that allows them to other certain groups of people. In other words, distinguish them as sort of irreconcilably different from themselves. For instance, instead of saying apartheid or segregation policies are based in race, Someone might try to justify these policies by claiming they're just preserving different cultures. And I want to make it very clear that justification is just as invalid and dangerous as just using the term race. Now, the race concept is something I am going to cover in detail uh, in another episode because it is very important, impactful, and nuanced, that term. Um, and it's something that is very dangerous and has had terrible repercussions from the past right into the present. But what is important to know for now is that while race has real social meaning and effects, it is not a real biological category. All humans are one single species, one biological human race. And race is not in any way synonymous with culture. There are many cultures within what we might socially define as one race, and there can be many races within one culture. Um, and this usage of the term culture is part of the reason many anthropologists have begun to um, steer clear of using the term altogether. Uh, and sort of in line with that, culture is not immutable, stagnant, or unchanging. It's dynamic and adaptable. This applies both over time and over space. So just because what we might define ourselves as, um, what, what specific culture group we define ourselves as today, that doesn't mean that that group has maintained the same practices it always has since the distant past. This is one common critique we can apply to many early anthropological works that often saw what they called primitive people, so uh, often the indigenous peoples of Australia, Africa, and the Americas, as relics of the past, unchanging in their traditions and life ways. We now understand that that is untrue. All human groups have incredibly rich and complicated pasts and have changed through history as they responded and acted with vari within various historical periods. As I've said, nuance. But let's discuss some culture concepts that have been used in anthropology. The earliest definition of culture typically cited comes from Edward Burnett Tyler. Um, he was an English anthropologist who is often considered the founder of cultural anthropology. He defined culture as that complex whole, which includes knowledge, belief, arts, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. Now this definition has stuck around since 1871, in part because it has many advantages. First of all, it identifies culture as complex and holistic, and it stresses that so-called cultural attributes are acquired. They are not innate, so they're not biological or strictly unchangeable. It is also in line with this sort of common sense understanding of how most uh, Euro North Americans would define culture. Like if you simply grabbed someone off the street who wasn't an anthropologist and asked them to define it. Nonetheless, this definition has critical drawbacks and few professional anthropologists today uh, would, would give this as the sole definition of culture without at least introducing some additional nuance. First of all, and most obviously, Tyler only indicates man in his definition. Obviously, we now know that women, as well as non-binary gender fluid and other genders of humans, also produce and are produced by culture. So that term in the definition, at the very least, must be replaced by people or human. 
Another critical issue is that Tyler's definition assumes internal homogeneity of a culture. So in other words, he assumes that everyone in a particular cultural group has the same knowledge, morals, and customs. But of course, all humans are unique and conform to cultural patterns to different degrees. When we talk about culture, we must always recognize the internal heterogeneity of a given group. Not everyone will agree and certainly not everyone will be the same. Additionally, Tyler suggests that cultures have clear cut boundaries. He assumes we can draw strict boundaries between what is us and what is them or other, which we can't always do. Cultural boundaries are porous. People can move between different groups uh, over their lifetimes, and these groups can be very blurry at the edges. In other words, we can't always say where precisely one cultural group stops and another cultural group starts. How much difference does there need to be before we define a whole new group? That, of course, is arbitrary. Lastly, Tyler paints culture as something stagnant. It, this means it does not change through time. So a given culture has always been a certain way, has always involved the same ceremonies, beliefs, and styles, and, and so on. And anything that has changed would then be considered inauthentic. Anthropologists now understand culture not as stagnant, like this definition suggests, but as dynamic. And sometimes it's even thought of as a process. All aspects of culture change over time, and the age of a tradition does not necessarily make it more or less authentic. So when we talk about Tyler's definition of culture, while it is something um, that, that helps in some ways, and it can be a really good introduction to the concept of culture, we need to keep all these critiques in mind. It is also important to note that Tyler's ideas they come from a social evolutionist school of thought. So this means Tyler understood cultures as arranged in an evolutionary hierarchy, some being more developed than others. This view has been rejected by today's anthropologists who understand that all societies are complex and cannot be organized in any sort of linear arrangement towards progress. Franz Boas also rejected the idea that cultures could be placed on some sort of evolutionary scale. He saw cultural boundaries as permeable, that sort of ideas and people could pass through them, and that these uh, boundaries were also overlapping, like a Venn diagram. He paid attention to history, and so Boaz could see that various cultural traits tended to diffuse from one place to another and to change over time. In fact, one of his students, Robert Lowy, once described culture as a thing of shreds and patches which begins to get at the idea that culture is not homogeneous, pure, or impermeably bounded. Thus, a Boazian definition of culture would be an integrated system of symbols, ideas, and values that should be studied as a working system, an organic whole. But anthropologists are always reviewing our past and revising our concepts to fit with new social situations and understandings. So in come the postmodernists. Okay. So if you study anthropology in any formal capacity, you will probably talk quite a bit about the writing culture debate uh, with its key players like James Clifford and George Marcus, who wrote Writing Culture, Leela Abaglugod, who wrote Writing Against Culture, and a bunch of things that anthropologists like to call turns. But, and this is my own opinion, while the debate is incredibly important to how we understand theory and practice uh, sociocultural anthropology, talking about the writing culture debate and the postmodernists in this light can become sort of like beating a dead horse. Especially for those of you like me who are millennial, zillennial, or Gen Z scholars and who are living in a much different world than that of the 1980s and 90s when these texts were initially written. So I'm going to give a very Sparks Notes version and link some additional reading in the comments. Um, and if this happens to really pique your interest and you want me to do a more in-depth episode, please leave a comment and I'll be sure to reconsider. Okay, so let's start the story in 1986 when James Clifford and George Marcus published Writing Culture. Although this is an arbitrary start date, as I'm sure they and others had started thinking about these issues long before its actual publication. This text began to critically question the objectivity anthropologists had previously claimed in their interpretations of so-called cultures. It encouraged anthropologists towards greater reflexivity. 
In other words, examining one's own feelings, reactions, motives, and how this uh, affects one's work. And engaged with ideas about how ethnographic writing, that is writing about cultures, um, could be done. It also asked what authority anthropologists really had in an increasingly fragmented yet global world. The new way of thinking ushered in, or perhaps represented by this text, is called the literary turn, the reflexive turn, or the postmodernist turn. However, while Clifford and Marcus were trying to figure out new ways to study culture, Leela, uh, sorry, Leela Abelugod felt that their criticism should go further, and anthropology should abandon the idea of culture altogether. From her position as both a feminist and someone of a mixed ethnic background, Abu Lugad is a Palestinian American, she understood the totalizing narratives uh, created by the culture concept as problematic. And many anthropologists agree. The concept of culture, when applied in an unnuanced form, as it often is when it's taken out of the context of anthropological scholarship and into the public realm of knowledge, which inevitably happens with all scholarship, as well as sometimes even by anthropologists ourselves. It can serve to stereotype whole populations by assuming cultural groups are homogenous. It loses out on the dissenters, the resistors, and the individual agents. And it often loses the dynamic context of change that human groups are constantly going through and instead portraying these cultures as static. The question then becomes one of extremes. Do anthropologists keep the culture concept and attempt to make more nuanced and useful to our scholarship despite its perhaps inherent problems? Or do we get rid of the outdated and homogenizing concept but risk it being taken up by others who don't have the critical and nuanced understanding of the culture concept that anthropologists do? As I said, it remains a highly contentious issue for many sociocultural anthropologists, to the point where it is not uncommon for a class in the subfield to be full of students whispering culture and throwing scare quotes into the air. So how would I define culture? Generally, I avoid it like the plague, because it can be very contentious. But today I'll try to put my thoughts about culture into some words. First of all, I think it's important that we understand culture as a sort of broad pattern, or better yet, as a process. It is not something stagnant, it is something dynamic, not only through time, but also across geographical space, as people move around the globe and adapt what they believe um, and practice to their new environments, both physical environments and social environments, such as political or economic situations. Not all people within what we might consider a singular cultural group are going to be exactly the same. Simply consider your own cultural group and how you differ from other people that you might also consider members of that group. There is a wealth of diversity on this planet and not all of it is cultural. Some of it's simply individual. It is important to remember that no one particular way of practicing a culture by a member of that given group is more authentic in any moral sense than any other. Older does not necessarily mean better or more pure. Another thing to consider is the blurriness of boundaries around cultures. These boundaries might be the geographical boundaries or borders where people mix in physical space but they might also be the theoretical boundaries that we try to actually draw between an us and a them. Generally speaking, anytime we draw a line, it's going to be somewhat arbitrary. So we need to understand boundaries as permeable and unclear. Takeaways from today about culture? Well, if you wanna try and define the term culture, you need to find a definition that understands all groups as heterogeneous, that culture is something acquired over the life course and thus is dynamic and changeable, not just within a single individual's lifetime, but also over historical time. And finally, you need to acknowledge the permeability of boundaries and the existence of marginal or border zones. At the end of the day, identifying culture is like identifying certain celestial bodies through a telescope. Sometimes you have to look away towards something else in order to see them clearly. Next week, we'll be talking about the comparative methods of sociocultural anthropology and take a deeper dive into participant observation. As always, let's go make the world safe for human differences.